And welcome to North Star Oasis, the fastest hour on television. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another action-packed episode. Now, what we would normally be doing at this particular time uh, is we're in the middle of showing the Ten Commandments videos by Dennis Prager, one commandment at a time. But this week we are actually skipping it. we got a really, really lot of stuff to go through today. And as a result, we're going to postpone commandment number nine, which would normally air today. We're going to postpone that one until next week. And a reminder, if you're, uh, and if you're just joining us first time or if you are a regular viewer, all of our episodes are available on YouTube. YouTube.com slash North Star Oasis. Check us out. Be part of our continuing discussion. But because we have a very, very hectic episode today, we are actually going to uh, go pretty much right to video. We're going to be talking about foreign policy. We're going to look at how the four major presidential candidates look at foreign policy, considering that there's 36 more weeks before the next presidential inauguration, and we're really winding it down on the nomination contest, so we want to make sure we start giving some more substance. You know, the mainstream media gives you a lot of a lot of the talking points and a lot of the rhetoric that has absolutely no substance behind it. Uh, how often do you hear these candidates speak about foreign policy? How often do you hear these candidates speak about the national debt? We don't even have debates anymore, which is where they used to be at least discussed for a minute or two, but that, that's gone away now. So what's happening is it's accusation versus accusation versus accusation versus accusation, and the substance gets lost. And everything is done in 10-second sound bites. And it's a really disservice that the mainstream media does on uh, political campaigns. And we're trying to give a little bit more in-depth uh, coverage on uh, how the candidates feel about issues. And so we're going to go right to Bernie Sanders and, uh, and take a look about what Bernie Sanders has to say about foreign policy. Let's go with the tape. Hamas and Hezbollah renounce their efforts to undermine the security of Israel. It will require the entire world to recognize Israel. Peace has to mean security for every Israeli from violence and terrorism. But peace also means security for every Palestinian. It means achieving self-determination, civil rights, and economic well-being for the Palestinian people. will mean ending what amounts to the occupation of Palestinian territory, establish, establishing mutually agreed upon borders, and pulling back settlements in the West Bank, just as Israel did in Gaza, once considered an unthinkable move on Israel's part. And that is why I join much of the international community, including the U.S. State Department and, Europe, and the European Union, in voicing my concern that Israel's recent expropriation of an additional 579 acres of land in the West Bank undermines the peace process and ultimately Israeli security as well. Peace will require strict adherence by both sides to the tenets of international humanitarian law. This includes Israeli ending disproportionate responses to being attacked, even though any attack on Israel is unacceptable. We recently saw a dramatic example of just how important this concept is. In 2014, the decades old, the conflict escalated once more as Israel launched a major military campaign against Hamas in the Gaza Strip. The Israeli offensive came after weeks of indiscriminate rocket fire into its territory and the kidnapping of Israeli citizens. Of course, I strongly object to Hamas's long-held position that Israel does not have a right to exist. That is unacceptable. And of course, I strongly condemn 
indiscriminate rocket fire by Hamas into Israeli territory and Hamas's use of civilian neighborhoods to launch those attacks. I condemn the fact that Hamas diverted funds and materials for much needed construction projects designed to improve the quality of life of the Palestinian people and instead use those funds to construct a network of tunnels for military purposes. However, let me also be very clear. I, along with many supporters of Israel, spoke out strongly against the Israeli counterattacks that killed nearly 1,500 civilians and wounded thousands more. I condemn the bombing of hospitals, schools, and refugee camps. Today, Gaza is still largely in ruins. The international community must come together to help Gaza recover. That doesn't mean rebuilding factories that produce bombs and missiles, but it does mean rebuilding schools, homes, and hospitals that are vital to the future of the Palestinian people. Yes. These are difficult subjects. They are hard to talk about for many Americans and for Israelis. While the U.S. has an important role, very important role to play in defeating ISIS, that struggle must be led by the Muslim countries themselves on the ground. I agree with King Abdullah of Jordan, who a number of months ago made it clear that what is going on there right now is nothing less than a battle for the soul of Islam and the only people who will effectively destroy is will effectively destroy ISIS there will be Muslim troops on the ground. So what we need is a coalition of those countries. Now I am not suggesting, not suggesting that Saudi Arabia or any other state in the region invade other countries nor unilaterally intervene in conflicts driven in part by sectarian tensions. What I am saying is that the major powers in that region, especially the Gulf states, have to take greater responsibility for the future of the Middle East and the defeat of ISIS. What I am saying is that countries like Qatar, which intends to spend up to $200 billion to host the 2022 World Cup. Qatar, which per capita is the wealthiest country in the world. Qatar can do much more to contribute to the fight against ISIS. If they are prepared to spend $200 billion for a soccer tournament, then they have got to spend a lot more in the fight against a barbaric organization. Now, what I am also saying is that other countries in the region, like Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia has the fourth largest defense budget in the world. People don't know that. The fourth largest defense budget in the world. And Saudi Arabia has got to dedicate itself more fully to the destruction of ISIS instead of other military adventures like the one it is pursuing right now in Yemen. It was the United States and our troops that reinstalled the royal family in Kuwait after Saddam Hussein's invasion in 1990. We put these people back on the throne. Now they have the obligation to work with us and other countries to destroy ISIS. Yeah. A very wealthy and some of these countries are extraordinarily wealthy from oil money or gas money. These very wealthy and powerful nations in that region can no longer expect the United States to do their work for them. Uncle Sam cannot and should not do it all. We are not the policemen of the world. Another major challenge in the region, of course, is the Syrian civil war. 
one of the worst humanitarian disasters in modern history. After five years of brutal conflict, the only solution in Syria will be, in my view, a negotiated political settlement. Now, the situation is not totally dissimilar from what has happened in Libya. We got rid of a terrible dictator there, Colonel Gaddafi, but right now chaos has erupted and ISIS now has a foothold uh, in that area. Bottom line is that regime change for a major power like us is not hard, but understanding what happens afterward is something that always has got to be taken into consideration. In my view, the military option for a powerful nation like ours, the most powerful in the world, should always be on the table. That's why we have the most powerful military in the world. But it should always be the last resort, not the first resort. Another major challenge in the region is Iran, which routinely destabilizes the Middle East and threatens the security of Israel. Now, I think all of us agree that Iran must not be able to acquire a nuclear weapon. That would just destabilize that entire region and create disastrous consequences. Where we may disagree is how to achieve that goal. I personally strongly supported the nuclear agreement with the United States, France, China, Germany, Russia, the United Kingdom, and Iran, because I believe it is the best hope to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. And I want to thank the Obama administration for doing a very good job under very, very difficult circumstances. Going forward, I believe we need a longer-term vision for dealing with Iran that balances two important objectives. First, we must counter the destabilizing behavior of Iran's leaders. But secondly, we must also leave the door open to more diplomacy to encourage Iranian moderates and the segments of the Iranian people, especially the younger generations, who want a better relationship with the West. There you have Bernie Sanders with his foreign policy speech in Salt Lake City. A couple of things. First of all, he discusses a lot about Israel versus Palestine. And everything he seems to do, at least in this speech, has come out on the favor of Palestine. And yet, what does Palestine really want? They want the destruction of Israel. And I think that's where Bernie Sanders is either missing it or just wrong. Um, he did say that the Saudis have an obligation to help destroy ISIS, and yes, that is true. Uh, there is a lot of oil money in the Gulf, and uh, he is correct about that. And, you know, the Saudis have done a lot in uh, providing paychecks. But if you recall early on in the ISIS campaign, Saudis did actually, and, and I think the... Um, the Jordanians and a few other countries in the Middle East actually did active airstrikes against ISIS. So that actually has been happening. Of course, Bernie Sanders, he's more, his foreign policy is more economically focused, as more than military focused. Uh, he is critical of NAFTA, and he does want to kill the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And, you know, this is the, killing the, the TPP. I actually agree with that. I, I think that the Obama campaign is uh, selling us short on that. But when he talks about the Syrian civil war and Iran's major challenge must uh, not be to be able to acquire the nuclear weapon, Go back to the December 5th, 2015 episode of North Star Oasis on YouTube, youtube.com slash North Star Oasis, December 5th, 2015. Our entire show went to the Syrian civil war and the birth of ISIS and how Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton helped create both of those situations. But right now we're going to move on and take a look at what Republican candidate Ted Cruz has to say on foreign policy. At that speech, Reagan discussed the present challenges, including 
the threat of terrorism. And in particular, he talked about the corrective that the U.S. Air Force had just sent to Colonel Gaddafi in Libya, encouraging him to give up terrorism. The corrective came in the form of a military jet and a bomb down his front porch. But I especially liked President Reagan's description of how one of his most famous appointees, UN Ambassador Gene Kirkpatrick, once explained to the rest of the world what it meant to have conservatives in charge of foreign policy. First, he talked about the U.S. government's approach towards terrorism. Quote, no nation, friend or foe, ally or adversary, should be surprised by the events of last week, he said of the recent and deliberate bombing. His actions made clear his determination to protect American lives and the world from terrorism. And then he singled out Ambassador Kirkpatrick. And yet, even at the start of the administration, people like Gene Kirkpatrick were offering some pretty broad hints that things will be different. How will the Reagan administration change American foreign policy? She was asked in 1981 at the United Nations. She answered correctly. She said, well, We've taken down our kick me sign. Today, we're once again facing challenging times, both at home and abroad. Again, we face an aggressive enemy whose goal is nothing less than the eradication of our very way of life. And there are many in this country who fear once again that we cannot defeat this enemy, that to even speak its name labels us bigots. It reminds me of that line from the movie, The Usual Suspect. The greatest trick the devil ever played was to convince the world he didn't exist. It seems when it comes to President Obama and Hillary Clinton, radical Islamic terrorism is something that just doesn't exist. But the rest of us living on terra firma, living in the real world, are aware that it is real, it is growing, and it is profoundly dangerous. Okay. Two key issues will demand the attention of our next president. Keeping America safe at home and strong abroad. Ensuring both should be the basic responsibility and the first priority of any commander in chief. I've also introduced legislation in the Senate to halt our refugee program from those coming from terror-ridden countries, in Syria in particular. There is no question that the humanitarian disaster is horrific. Millions of people have been displaced by the savage violence. Millions are now living in camps that place severe strain on the resources of our allies. And it's natural that out of our generosity, we want to help stop that misery. And while the United States has been the largest donor to the refugee cause by a factor of 10, giving $1.2 billion of taxpayer funds, 10 times what any other nation has contributed, we cannot make the mistake of extending the same generosity to the extent of imperiling the safety and security of American citizens. Stop. Now, I will also note, there are some on both the right and the left who want to exploit the current crisis by calling on Americans to surrender our constitutional liberties is the only way to ensure our safety. The Bill of Rights is altogether compatible with protecting the safety and security of American citizens. On the right, there are some who have called for resurrecting the government's bulk data collection that existed under the Patriot Act. More data from millions of law-abiding Americans is not always better data. Hoarding tens of billions of records of ordinary citizens, it didn't stop Fort Hood. It didn't stop Boston, it didn't stop Chattanooga, it didn't stop Garland, and it failed to detect the San Bernardino plot. 
when the focus of law enforcement and national security is on law-abiding citizens rather than targeting the bad guys, we miss the bad guys while violating the constitutional rights of American citizens. In addition to those voices on the rights who are suggesting sweeping aside citizens' Fourth Amendment rights, there are voices on the left who are taking the same approach and want us to voluntarily surrender our Second Amendment rights. Both of these approaches are misguided. And that brings me to my second point. In addition to protecting Americans here at home, the strategy to defeat the enemy begins by calling it by its name, radical Islamic terrorism. These wolves are not lone. They are instead operating as an ideological pack. And the thing that unites them is their fanatical adherence to Islamic supremacism. The conviction that the world must submit to their form of Islam or die. Quite simply, we do not have a side in the Syrian civil war. It's not very fashionable these days in Washington. Indeed, it is not difficult to find politicians in Washington who will thunder, we must topple Assad with the same ferocity with which they thundered, we must topple Gaddafi, we must topple Mubarak. And we've seen the catastrophic results of these myopic policies. And I would note that my view that we don't have a side in the Syrian civil war is shared by at least one other world leader with a clear-eyed and direct vision to what's happening. Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu was asked when he visited Washington last month why he didn't intervene in the in this Syrian civil war. And he responded simply that he would only do so if he had a clear side, which at this point he did not. Ronald Reagan was the single greatest liberator of human oppression that the world has ever known. He did not do it by forcing democracy on unwilling nations, but by an unwavering determination to defeat communism. After two terms of an Obama-Clinton foreign policy so disastrous, it makes the Carter administration look good. We are in a desperate need once again for clarity. The clarity of Ronald Reagan's four most important words, we win, they lose. We will not win by replacing dictators, as unpleasant as they may be, with terrorists who want to kill us and destroy America. And we can take heart in the knowledge that like Reagan, we are not abandoning freedom. We are doing what we must to protect it because the true threat to the spread of liberty is the radical Islamism that is every bit as oppressive as Soviet communism. And while the rebels who oppose regional strongmen, who turn out to be jihadis, are not ultimately helpful in this cause, there are others who are and we should be able to figure out the difference. As Ambassador Kirkpatrick wrote, it may not always be easy to distinguish between democratic and totalitarian agents of change, but it is also not too difficult. Authentic democratic revolutionaries aim at securing governments based on the consent of the government, uh, the governed, and believe that ordinary men are capable of using freedom, knowing their own interests, and choosing leaders. A case in point. is perhaps the single greatest blunder of the Obama administration and one of its first in 2009, when the president ignored the Green Revolution in Iran, thereby forfeiting an opportunity to replace the radical Islamist terrorist-sponsoring terror regime in Tehran that chants death to America and death to Israel and pursues nuclear weapons and instead 
America could have stood with a peaceful secular rebellion that was crying out for support from the United States. There was a case where regime change squared up with our most pressing national need. But instead of standing with the Iranian people in what could have been his tear down this wall moment, instead President Obama felt silent and decided to open up nego negotiations with the mullahs instead. So while the paroxysms of the so-called Arab Spring did not produce a wave of flowering democracies in the Middle East, but rather a tsunami of chaos and unrest, including a new and even more virulent strain of radical Islamic terrorism most sensationally embodied by ISIS, there may be future such opportunities that the next president should not squander. We can lead by example and demonstrate the positive effects of democracy. As Ambassador Kirkpatrick further noted, it is not impossible that U.S. policy could effectively encourage this process of liberalization and democratization, provided that the effort was made at a time when the incumbent government is fighting for its life against violent adversaries and that the proposed reforms are aimed at producing gradual change rather than to perfect democracy overnight. To accomplish this, policymakers are needed who understand how actual democracies have actually come into being. History is a better guide than good intentions. There are a number of encouraging 20th century examples of liberalizations that should give us hope. The flourishing, vibrant democracy that is Israel is one of the great gifts the last seven decades have bestowed on America. We shouldn't squander it. The end of the Cold War produced a unified, democratic Germany, as well as the vibrant democracies of Eastern Europe, all strategic allies and assets to the United States. We can most effectively continue this process by embracing our own ideals, by standing unapologetically for freedom, by defending Americans here in our country, by having the courage to speak with moral clarity, to call evil by its name, by unapologetically defending America's interest around the globe, and by using the bully pulpit of the presidency to invite others to recognize the rights of individuals, to respect them, and to unite against the evil forces who seek to tear down freedom in every corner of the world. And that was Ted Cruz speaking in front of the Heritage Foundation. Uh, well, the thing we know about Ted Cruz on foreign policy is that he opposed the Iran nuclear deal and he opposed the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but he admitted that, not necessarily in this speech, but he does admit that he wants to renegotiate the TPP. Uh, he has said in this speech and other, in many other occasions that he wants to get tough on ISIS. And again, go back to December 5th, 2015 episode of North Star Oasis to get the origin of ISIS down. Uh, he does point out that politicians want to exploit the current crisis for their own uh, well-being. Uh, his priority is keeping America safe at home and safe at abroad. Um, again, it's all, all rhetoric, and that's the problem I have with political speeches at this time on, on a major concept like foreign policy because there's no specifics. There were really no specifics from Bernie. There were no specifics from Ted Cruz so far. Um, you know, he talks a lot about ideals, which is all fine and dandy, but exactly what is it that you want to accomplish? That's what I have a problem with. Uh, but I think the most valid point that he made in this entire speech was that President Obama ignored the Green Revolution in Iran. And if he would have done more during that point in time, that things in Iran could have changed and changed for the better. And I think that is where Ted Cruz is spot on with his assessment. Uh, we're going to move on to Donald Trump. Here's the video will outline today will also return us to a timeless principle. My foreign policy will always put the interests of the American people and American security above all else. 
has to be first, has to be. That will be the foundation of every single decision that I will make. Logic was replaced with foolishness and arrogance, which led to one foreign policy disaster after another. They just kept coming and coming. We went from mistakes in Iraq to Egypt to Libya to President Obama's line in the sand in Syria. Each of these actions have helped to throw the region into chaos and gave ISIS the space it needs to grow and prosper. First, our resources are totally overextended. President Obama has weakened our military by weakening our economy. He's crippled us with wasteful spending, massive debt, low growth, a huge trade deficit, and open borders. I am the only person running for the presidency who understands this, and this is a serious problem. I'm the only one, believe me, I know them all, I'm the only one that knows how to fix it. <laughs> Secondly, our allies are not paying their fair share, and I've been talking about this recently a lot. The countries we are defending must pay for the cost of this defense, and if not, the U.S. must be prepared to let these countries defend themselves. We have no choice. <laughs> Thirdly, our friends are beginning to think they can't depend on us. We've had a president who dislikes our friends and bows to our enemies, something that we've never seen before in the history of our country. Iran cannot be allowed to have a nuclear weapon, cannot be allowed, remember that, cannot be allowed to have a nuclear weapon. And under a Trump administration, will never, ever be allowed to have that nuclear weapon. All of this without even mentioning the humiliation of the United States with Iran's treatment of our 10 captured sailors. So vividly, I remember that day. In negotiation, you must be willing to walk. The Iran deal, like so many of our worst agreements, is the result of not being willing to leave the table. Your friends need to know that you will stick by the agreements that you have with them. You've made that agreement, you have to stand by it, and the world will be a better place. President Obama gutted our missile defense program, then abandoned our missile defense plans with Poland and the Czech Republic. He supported the ouster of a friendly regime in Egypt that had a long-standing peace treaty with Israel and then helped bring the Muslim Brotherhood to power in its place. Israel, our great friend, and the one true democracy in the Middle East, has been snubbed and criticized by an administration that lacks moral clarity. Fourth, our rivals no longer respect us. In fact, they're just as confused as our allies. But an even bigger problem is that they don't take us seriously anymore. Truth is, they don't respect us. When President Obama landed in Cuba on Air Force One, no leader was there, nobody, to greet him. Perhaps an incident without precedent in the long and prestigious history of Air Force One. Then amazingly, the same thing happened in Saudi Arabia. It's called no respect, absolutely no respect. Do you remember when the president made a long and expensive trip to Copenhagen, Denmark, to get the Olympics for our country? And after this unprecedented effort, it was announced that the United States came in fourth, fourth place. If President Obama's goal had been to weaken America, he could not have done a better job. Finally, America no longer has a clear understanding of our foreign policy goals. Since the end of the Cold War and the breakup of the Soviet Union, we've lacked a coherent foreign policy. One day we're bombing Libya and getting rid of a dictator to foster democracy for civilians the next day, we're watching the same civilians suffer while that country falls and absolutely falls apart. 
lives lost, massive monies lost. The world is a different place. We're a humanitarian nation. But the legacy of the Obama-Clinton interventions will be weakness, confusion, and disarray. A mess. We've made the Middle East more unstable and chaotic than ever before. We left Christians subject to intense persecution and even genocide. We have done nothing to help the Christians, nothing. And we should always be ashamed for that, for that lack of action. Our actions in Iraq, Libya, and Syria have helped unleash ISIS. And we're in a war against radical Islam, but President Obama won't even name the enemy. And unless you name the enemy, you will never, ever solve the problem. Hillary Clinton also refuses to say the words radical Islam, even as she pushes for a massive increase in refugees coming into our country. After Secretary Clinton's failed intervention in Libya, Islamic terrorists in Benghazi took down our consulate and killed our ambassador and three brave Americans. Then, instead of taking charge that night, Hillary Clinton decided to go home and sleep. Incredible. Clinton blames it all on a video, an excuse that was a total lie, proven to be absolutely a total lie. Our ambassador was murdered, and our secretary of state misled the nation. And by the way, she was not awake to take that call at 3 o'clock in the morning. And now ISIS is making millions and millions of dollars a week selling Libya oil. And you know what? We don't blockade, we don't bomb, we don't do anything about it. It's almost as if our country doesn't even know what's happening, which could be a fact and could be true. This will all change when I become president. To our friends and allies, I say America is going to be strong again. America is going to be reliable again. It's going to be a great and reliable ally again. It's going to be a friend again. We're going to finally have a coherent foreign policy based upon American interests and the shared interests of our allies. First, we need a long-term plan to halt the spread and reach of radical Islam. We must stop importing extremism through senseless immigration policies. We have no idea where these people are coming from. There's no documentation. There's no paperwork. There's nothing. We have to be smart. We have to be vigilant. A pause for reassessment will help us. <laughs> Secondly, we have to rebuild our military and our economy. The Russians and Chinese have rapidly expanded their military capability, but look at what's happened to us. Our nuclear weapons arsenal, our ultimate deterrent, has been allowed to atrophy and is desperately in need of modernization and renewal, and it has to happen immediately. <laughs> Finally, we must develop a foreign policy based on American interests. Businesses do not succeed when they lose sight of their core interests, and neither do countries. I challenge anyone to explain the strategic foreign policy vision of Obama-Clinton. It has been a complete and total disaster. I will also be prepared to deploy America's economic resources. Financial leverage and sanctions can be very, very persuasive. But we need to use them selectively and with total determination. Our power will be used if others do not play by the rules. In other words, if they do not treat us fairly. Our friends and enemies must know that if I draw a line in the sand, I will enforce that line in the sand. Believe me. <laughs> However, 
Unlike other candidates for the presidency, war and aggression will not be my first instinct. You cannot have a foreign policy without diplomacy. A superpower understands that caution and restraint are really, truly signs of strength. Although not in government service, I was totally against the war in Iraq, very proudly, saying for many years that it would destabilize the Middle East. Sadly, I was correct. And the biggest beneficiary has been Iran, who is systematically taking over Iraq and gaining access to their very, very rich oil reserves. And that is Donald J. Trump with his foreign policy speech. Couple of things. I, I appreciate the fact that he's an alpha male, which we didn't see with Al Gore back in 2000, back when he had to reinvent himself about five times. But to come out and say, I'm the only one who knows the problem, and I'm the only one who, know, who knows how to fix it. I think that's a little bit much. Because I'll tell you this, Donald J. Trump, if you are watching, I also know what the problems are. We've covered them on this show. I also know what the solutions are. You are not the only person. There are a couple of us. I'm just not running for president right now. But seriously, um, you know, um, he makes an extremely valid point when he says that America no longer has a clear indication of its foreign policy goals. And I took a foreign policy course at Concordia University, St. Paul, just a couple of years ago. That was about five years ago. And you know what? I noticed that too. We have lost our way. We do not know what our foreign policy goals are. The thing I appreciate about Donald Trump in this speech is that it is a damning indictment on the Barack Obama administration. I mean, he, he lays it all out about Iran. Uh, other countries need to pay their fair share and defend themselves. Well, that kind of sounds what Bernie Sanders had to say earlier in the show. Uh, he covered um, Iran not being allowed to have a nuclear weapon. Uh, brings up the humiliation of the 10 U.S. sailors who were captured. So, I mean, he really was able to tap in there. I think the most important thing, though, that Donald Trump has identified is the fact that we have done nothing to help the persecuted Christians in the Middle East who are losing their lives at the hand of ISIS. And I think that is you know, the big takeaway from this speech is that at least he recognizes the problem. And of course, he, he mentions about the fact that President Obama and Hillary Clinton, they have not named who the enemy is. And how can you fight a war against an enemy if you're not even going to name that enemy. So he, he made a lot of valid points here. Again, other than saying I'm the biggest, I'm the strongest, and I know how to handle it, he never really goes into how he's going to solve these problems and looking at the unintended consequences. Uh, and I'm just trying to be honest on all four of these candidates. I'll give you the pluses. I'll give you the weaknesses. Uh, it, it's, it, you know, this is my interpretation of what I see happening based upon the same information that you have. Um, but I'll tell you this, the, the one thing that I really actually appreciate out of this was when he said that he was not, that Hillary Clinton uh, on the night of Benghazi was not awake to take that 3 a.m. phone call. And if you remember in 2008, that was a big thing with Hillary Clinton in her uh, attack against uh, Barack Obama was that the... Uh, that you know, in that uh, when it was three o'clock in the morning, who was going to be prepared to take that? The, you know what? Let's just show you the ad. Here's the Hillary Clinton 3 a.m. ad. It's 3 a.m. and your children are safe and asleep, but there's a phone in the White House and it's ringing. Something's happening in the world. Your vote will decide who answers that call. Whether it's someone who already knows the world's leaders, knows the military, someone tested and ready to lead in a dangerous world. It's 3 a.m. and your children are safe and asleep. Who do you want answering the phone? I'm Hillary Clinton and I approve this message. That was Hillary Clinton in 2008. And by Hillary Clinton just a couple of years later, according to Donald Trump, was not even awake at 3 a.m. to take that phone call from Benghazi. So. That's, that's, is that going to be a precursor of what we see in the general election?
and we'll find out. But in the meantime, let's see what Hillary Clinton has to say about foreign policy since she was the former Secretary of State. She was the for, you know, First Lady when uh, her husband Bill Clinton was uh, President. She was a U.S. Senator from the state of New York. So let's see what Hillary Clinton has to say about foreign policy. But I want to begin by saying we cannot give in to fear. We can't let it stop us from doing what is right and necessary to make us safe and doing it in a way that is consistent with our values. We cannot let fear push us into reckless actions that end up making us less safe. Americans are going to have to act with both courage and clarity. Now, as we all know, on December 2nd, two shooters killed 14 people at a holiday party in San Bernardino, California. Sadly, in America in 2015, turning on the news and hearing about a mass shooting is not unusual. But this one turned out to be different because these killers were a husband and wife inspired by ISIS. Americans have experienced terrorism before. On 9-11, we learned that terrorists in Afghanistan could strike our homeland. From Fort Hood to Chattanooga to the Boston Marathon, we saw people radicalized here carrying out deadly attacks. The phrase active shooter should not be one we have to teach our children, but it is. Just as we have defeated those who've threatened us in the past. Because it is not enough to contain ISIS, we must defeat ISIS, break its momentum, and then it's back. And not just ISIS, but the broader radical jihadist movement that also includes Al-Qaeda and offshoots like Al-Shabaab in Somalia. Now, waging and winning this fight will require serious leadership. But unfortunately, our political debate has been anything but serious. We can't afford another major ground war in the Middle East. That's exactly what ISIS wants from us. Shallow slogans don't add up to a strategy. <laughs> Council on Foreign Relations, I laid out a three-part plan to defeat ISIS and the broader extremist movement. One, defeat ISIS in the Middle East by smashing its stronghold, hitting its fighters, leaders, and infrastructure from the air, and intensifying support for local forces who can pursue them on the ground. Second, defeat them around the world by dismantling the global network of terror that supplies radical jihadists with money, arms, propaganda, and fighters. And third, defeat them here at home by foiling plots, disrupting radicalization, and hardening our defenses. Now, these three lines of effort reinforce one another, so we need to pursue them all at once using every pillar of American power. It will require skillful diplomacy to continue Secretary Kerry's efforts to encourage political reconciliation in Iraq and political transition in Syria, enabling more Sunni Arabs and Kurdish fighters to take on ISIS on both sides of the border and to get our Arab and Turkish partners to actually step up and do their part. So there is a lot to do. And today I want to focus on the third part of my plan, how we defend our country and prevent radicalization here at home. We need a comprehensive strategy to counter each step in the process that can lead to an attack like the one in San Bernardino. First, we have to shut down ISIS recruitment in the United States, especially online. Second, stop would-be jihadists from getting training overseas 
and stop foreign terrorists from coming here. Third, discover and disrupt plots before they can be carried out. Fourth, support law enforcement officers who risk their lives to prevent and respond to attacks. And fifth, empower our Muslim American communities who are on the front lines of the fight against radicalization. This is a 360-degree strategy to keep America safe, and I want to walk through each of the elements from recruitment to training to planning to execution. First, shutting down recruitment. We have to stop jihadists from radicalizing new recruits in person and through social media, chat rooms, and what's called the dark web. To do that, we need stronger relationships between Washington, Silicon Valley, and all of our great tech companies and entrepreneurs. American innovation is a powerful force, and we have to put it to work defeating ISIS. That starts with understanding where and how recruitment happens. Our security professionals need to more effectively track and analyze ISIS's social media posts and map jihadist networks, and they need help from the tech community. Companies should redouble their efforts to maintain and enforce their own service agreements and other necessary policies to police their networks, identifying extremist content and removing it. We recruited specialists fluent in Arabic, Urdu, and Somali to wage online battles with extremists to counter their propaganda. Now, these efforts have not kept pace with the threat, so we need to step up our game in partnership with the private sector and credible, moderate voices outside government. But that's just some of what we have to do. Experts from the FBI, the intelligence community, Homeland Security, DOD, the State Department, and the technology industry should work together to develop a unified national strategy to defeat ISIS in cyberspace. Using all of our capabilities to deny jihadists virtual territory, just as we work to deny them actual territory. And at the same time, we have to do more to address the challenge of radicalization, whatever form it takes. It's imperative that the Saudis the Qataris, the Kuwaitis, and others stop their citizens from supporting radical schools, madrasas, and mosques around the world once and for all, and that should be the top priority in all of our discussions with these countries. Third, we have to discover and disrupt jihadist plots before they can be carried out. This is going to take better intelligence, collection, analysis, and sharing. I've proposed an intelligence surge against ISIS that includes more operations officers and linguists, enhancing our technical surveillance of overseas targets, intercepting terrorist communications, flying more reconnaissance missions to track terrorist movements, and developing even closer partnerships with other intelligence services. President Obama recently signed the USA Freedom Act, which was passed by a bipartisan majority in Congress. It protects civil liberties while maintaining capabilities that our intelligence and law enforcement agencies need to keep us safe. So make sure jihadists don't get the tools they need to carry out attacks. It defies common sense that Republicans in Congress refuse to make it harder for potential terrorists to buy guns. If you are too dangerous to fly, you are too dangerous to buy a gun, period. And we should insist
We should insist on comprehensive background checks and closed loopholes that allow potential terrorists to buy weapons online or at gun shows. And I think it's time to restore the ban on assault weapons and high capacity <laughs> magazines. We are the greatest nation on earth, not in spite of the challenge. Well, that was Hillary Clinton uh, discussing foreign policy. Okay, we took that speech right off of Hillary Clinton's website. Um, we should insist on a comprehensive background check. If you're not safe to fly, you shouldn't be safe to own a gun. Maybe if you're not safe to fly, that maybe we could profile you and you know, you know bring back racial profiling. Maybe we can actually quit letting through... Um, uh, little old ladies, grandmothers, or little kids uh, from the TSA screenings and actually start profiling the people who are more likely to be suspects. Uh, again, that's just my, my thoughts on, on differences with uh, Secretary Clinton. Because we're running out of time on this episode, I do have just a couple of very quick points, and it's going to be throwbacks to previous shows that we've done. Uh, November 21st of 2015. Our uh, episode titled ISIS Explains. Uh, it includes Hillary Clinton's plan to defeat ISIS. We went a little bit more in depth with it. And how her plan is almost identical to George W. Bush's plan to defeat Al-Qaeda. And there was, you know, when we made that comparison, we had shown uh, George W. Bush's uh, speeches and when George W. Bush's policies and Hillary Clinton's statements. Her what she wants to do is refight the war in Iraq with uh, George Bush's plan, at least while campaigning. But who knows what's going to happen when she becomes president, if she becomes president. And that is actually the episode, November 21st, 2015, where we really went in depth and explained the origins of ISIS. I actually, during her, uh, her speech, I actually had taken a closer look at that. And the other thing is she mentioned Al-Shabaab. April 25th, 2015, we also brought in El Shabaab and how they are the largest poacher of elephants. And if you, and how uh, the ivory ban is actually probably counterproductive in both terrorism and saving elephants. So go and check those two episodes out on uh, April 25th, 2015, and November 21st, 2015, along with December 5th, 2015, on YouTube. YouTube.com slash North Star Oasis. We have one more clip because there has been an internet meme that has been uh, showing up lately about Hillary Clinton defending a rapist of a 12 year old girl uh, in 1975. Let's go right to the uh, film. Well, unexpectedly in Europe, and also straight to camera. So that's interesting. She answered this question during her swing through Europe as part of her book tour. She fielded questions from readers on Mumsnet, which is a leading British parenting website visited mostly by women. She talked about contraceptive rights, guns, advice for young women. And she also commented on this rape case. One reader asking her, as a lawyer, you defended the rapist of a 12-year-old girl calling the victim, quote, emotionally unstable and saying the girls have a tendency to, quote, exaggerate or romanticize sexual experiences, especially when they come from disorganized families. The question was, any comments? And here's what Clinton said. When I was a 27-year-old attorney doing legal aid work uh, at uh, the law school where I taught in Fayetteville, Arkansas, uh, I was appointed by uh, the local judge to represent a criminal defendant accused of rape. I asked to be relieved of that responsibility, but I was not, and I had a professional duty uh, to represent my client uh, to the best of my ability, which I did. He later pled guilty to a lesser included offense. Uh, when you're a lawyer, you often uh, don't have uh, the uh, choice as to who you will represent. And by the very nature of criminal law, there will be those who you represent that uh, you don't approve of. But uh, at least in our system, uh, you have an obligation. And once I was appointed, I fulfilled that obligation. No, Clinton does and, not address uh, the part of the question. That's what Hillary Clinton's statement is. Uh, again, because we are running out of time, we're not going to really get into that. Other than to say that uh, the <clears throat> that I will have to agree with Secretary Clinton on. Um, well, we'll talk about it later. Jeff Williams, North Star Oasis. See you next week.